All right, you guys. So quick introduction in case you guys were not here um, with us online. Last week, my name is Roxana and I did the Posture Alignment Workshop. And today I'm going to be doing the Digestive Health Seminar. So we're going to learn some information about our digestive systems and my tips on how to improve your digestive system. Do not worry. I'm not going to tell anyone you have to go become a raw vegan. I think that's what everyone's scared about. They're like, please don't tell me you have to give up meat and dairy. The holidays are coming up. I plan on eating pie until kingdom come. Okay. Don't worry about that. We're just going to learn how it works and some things you guys can do um, just to manage it better. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and screen, uh, share my screen with you guys. Perfect. Okay. So here's our wellness workshop. Um, yes. Today's date. Okay. We did uh, kind of go over this, you guys. I do want to go over the um, waiver just for legality reasons. I have to to make sure everyone um, had this read to them and went over it. So basically, it just says you're just listening to this seminar. Take your advice, and if you see or hear anything that you like, obviously ask your doctor, and then you guys can take the process, uh, the necessary steps if you wish. If not, do not um, take my advice. I'm not your doctor, so legally. Um, you guys always have to consult your own doctor before you do anything. Okay, so we're just going to go over the point of the seminar, and these are going to be the main topics. We're going to talk about what it uh, means to eat clean, the importance of eating clean, the importance of having a healthy digestive system, uh, the key players in the digestive system, how to improve the digestive system. I'm going to share with you guys my story about how I came across um, sharing and changing all my uh, eating habits. And then the lessons I've learned along my journey and then how to eat what and when and how to order food when socializing, right? So when you guys go out, you know what to do. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. What does it mean to eat clean? So you guys, eating clean is going to vary from person to person because the person who eat, who is eating an omnivorous diet, which is animal-based products like meat, dairy, and eggs, and seafood, as well as plants. And then some people are going to say just a straight vegan diet, which is plant but Based diet, which is no um, animal byproducts. Some people may say all organic. So maybe you want to just, just get your grass fed, free range, um, still eating animal based products, but you're just buying the healthier versions. It's going to vary from person to person. And I just want you guys to say, I don't think there's a definitive answer for this. I just wanted to hear what you guys were thinking because I don't want anyone to feel obligated or forced. No, you have to eat plant based or you have to buy everything organic and go broke because we all know organic is so expensive. So I just want to share that it can be whatever you guys want. And as we continue on with this discussion, hopefully you guys can make sense of what eating clean is going to make sense for you because we're all different. So whatever diet you have, you may feel like, okay, for me, I think this is how I'm going to start defining clean eating from here on out. Okay. So we're going to go back to uh, screen share. And basically I'm just going to tell you guys, it's all about digestion. Okay. So no surprise there. Why is it really important to eat clean? Because of your digestion, okay? So for some of you, it may mean no fast food. It can mean nothing that comes in a box, nothing that comes packaged. Everything has to be coming from your produce or your meat section, right? So we're just gonna talk about the importance of all that stuff by starting with the problems we may have. So you know you have digestion issues when you have gas, diarrhea, nausea, constipation, bloating, vomiting, and or heartburn, okay? Some of you guys may think that, oh, I didn't know this was part of your digestive system. Some of you guys may know that you have these because of other symptoms, maybe because of your pills or maybe some surgeries you've had, or maybe, you know, you have some food allergies, you know, you shouldn't be eating it, but you do, and you have these symptoms. So this is just a general consensus of what goes on when you do have a digestion issue. The big one, purpose of the digestive system. Okay, purpose of the digestive system is to nourish the cells and provide energy for the body, right? So the first answer was to keep you alive. Yes, you don't stay alive if you don't have any energy. You're basically just gonna shut down and your brain just you know, dies off. There's no energy going to the brain, you're not functioning. The other one is to nourish the cells in our body, okay? So we need to nourish those cells because unfortunately a lot of people, a lot of you may or may not know, um, the cells, they get regenerated or you get new ones every six months for the most part. Um, and if you're not, you know, taking good care of them, the cells die. And that's something that, you know, you want to make sure you have some good new ones coming in. If any of you guys sneeze and you look inside your tissue, you're going to see some, you know, ooey gooeyness that's not cute. Those are um, dead white cells, right? Because they fought off whatever infection or allergy you had. 
So we're constantly having a change of cells. So the whole thing is, is you want to keep nourishing the cells that are coming and the ones you have, you want to make sure they're nice and um, good to go and healthy and strong. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide, how the digestive system works. So this is just going to be high school science here, nothing new or shocking information. We're just going to go over it just as a refresher for everyone. Um, obviously, digestive system starts in the mouth. Now, this is kind of maybe alarming for most people because they don't think it starts in the mouth, but it does. And it comes with how much you chew or not chew. So if you guys have digestion issues, believe it or not, the more you chew your food before you swallow, the better it is. One, you have to eat slowly. I know it's really hard not to scarf down your food, especially when Thanksgiving's coming around. You want to inhale it before someone else does and they finish it and you don't get your share of whatever it is. <laughs> um, but you have to eat slowly because when you guys eat fast, you inhale a lot of air and that causes gas. Once that gas makes its way down, it comes out and it's not cute, okay? It can be bloating when it pushes on your intestines and it hurts. Or if you release gas, it can be embarrassing or just awkward. So try your best when you're chewing. Eat slowly. Do not inhale air. Also, do not talk with your mouth full. I know we heard this as children from our parents, but it's not just about manners. It's about also intaking air because when you speak, you're using the air in your trachea. But when you eat and swallow, you got to use your esophagus. So when you have that flap going back and forth at the same time because you're eating and chewing and trying to swallow, you're going to get air in the esophagus and we don't want it, okay? So chew slowly. They stay about 20 to 25 bites per spoonful, okay? That's a lot of chewing. If the food you have in your mouth has not gone out in 20 to 25 bites, I'm going to ask you, what are you eating that you cannot break down in your mouth between the heat in your mouth? and your saliva. So take a double uh, look at what you're eating. Maybe it's a jawbreaker or hard candies. I don't know about those, but other than that, between 20 to 25 bites. Um, for eating slowly, a really good tip is making sure you put down your silverware or if it's hand food, finger food, put it down each time. So if I take a bite, I'm putting whatever I have down, counting 20, 25 bites, and then picking it up again. It's gonna really ensure you're eating slowly, okay? Anyways, moving on from the mouth. Now you've swallowed what you've chewed and it's going to the esophagus and the esophagus is going to start sending alerts to your brain that, Hey, we need to turn on the digestive system and it sends those signals to start peristalsis, which is a rippling motion of muscles in the digestive tract. Okay. That's how we start pushing the food down our bodies all the way out. Okay. After the esophagus comes down to the stomach. Now the upper muscle in the stomach allows the food to enter and lower muscles um, mix the food, okay? So one is just, hey, kind of like the bouncer at a club, you're allowed to enter, okay, good, you're in. Now the lower muscle is like, all right, you guys, let's start dancing and mingling here. We're gonna mix with the digestive juices. Um, just a quick note on these digestive juices, someone who is plant-based um, and you come off of plant-based and eat something like a steak or a dairy, it's going to be harder for you to, to digest something just because the amount of your digestive juices do decrease over time, right? Because you don't need all that uh, acid in your stomach if you're eating plant-based because plant-based is pretty easy to break down as opposed to someone who's eating an omnivorous diet. They have a lot more acid. And when you have a lot more acid, um, you're more likely to have heartburn or um, acid reflux, right? Because you know, you're eating acidic food. That's what animals are. They're acidic. They're not alkalinized like plants. And then you're throwing acid on top of acid. When you eat your meat on top of your stomach acid, it's acid on top of acid. And sometimes it can come up. So the digestive juices here is something to take note of. We'll talk about later. I just wanted to kind of touch on it now. After the food has left your stomach, we're going to the small intestine, okay? So the walls of the small intestine absorb all the water, okay? This is what's going to eventually get into our, our bladder and we're going to, you know, urinate that out. The digested nutrients, which was the second part of my question earlier, what is the purpose of the, of the digestive system, which is to get nutrients to nourish our cells, to keep us alive. So those nutrients get absorbed into the bloodstream and the waste, uh, whatever's left over from the water and the nutrients becomes waste. And that's when we have it go to a bowel movement. Okay. That goes to the large intestine. Pancreas and liver, they have a great um, team effort here. Their digestive juices aid in breaking down nutrients in the small intestine. So it's a further, um, think of it as a micro organizing or uh, a micro, you know, tasking about who goes where and what. The large intestine, we already said, it's going to go ahead and make that all into a bowel movement for you. Hopefully it's going to turn all those liquids into solids. Hopefully some of us do have, um, unfortunately, stools that are not hard or maybe they're too hard. 
and sometimes they just stay liquid and that's when you also you know you have you know something going on right you don't want your stools too soft or too hard you want them kind of like goldilocks right in the middle you want it to be like a soft hard right and then the rectum is uh, where we store that stool until it's pushed out of the anus during a bowel movement. Now that sounds so lovely to discuss <laughs> right before our lunch break. <laughs> but anyways, that was just a quick recap of our digestive system. Any questions there? No, right? Okay, if you do, let me know. All right, continuing on. Now we refreshed our high school science, right? I don't know why it keeps taking me back to this screen, but oh, there it is. Okay, interesting ways to improve digestion. Believe it or not, get more sleep, okay? When you don't get enough sleep, you're not gonna do a really good uh, job digesting. So the thing is, is when you sleep, your body is responsible for doing a lot of stuff at night, okay? You're trying to repair broken and dead cells. You're trying to um, uh, fix any maybe soreness you may have. That's when you guys feel like, oh, I feel like really dead, tired. Maybe I overworked it. Um, and hopefully you get re-energized throughout the night. Also, whatever you did not break down and digest from breakfast, lunch, hopefully you catch up on it during uh, nighttime and also your dinner, assuming you had dinner. So if you don't have enough sleep, you're not giving your body enough time to break everything down, do all the stuff it has to do. It's like maintenance crew, right? If you don't give them enough hours, they're not going to get you know their job done in time. So by the time you wake up, you're like, oh, I still don't feel good. I still feel bloated. I don't know why my stomach is heavy. I didn't feel like I, I, I digested my food and you don't have a bowel movement in the morning. Okay. So make sure you get enough sleep so you can give your body enough time. All right. The second one, drinking enough water. Now drinking enough water is interesting because a lot of people don't think that uh, drinking enough water or digestion will have to do anything because digestion is something you eat, right? But if you don't have enough water, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to get a bowel movement as easily. So if you're constipated a lot, Make sure you're drinking enough water. Always ask your doctor. There's a few tips or tricks you may consult with. Obviously, ask your doctor is one, making sure your urine in the toilet bowl is light yellow, okay? It should be so clear. If you were to put a book on the bottom of that toilet, you should be able to read on top of it. That's how clear it should be. But if it's really foggy, cloudy, really dark yellow, you're not gonna be able to see those words. Another one is to think of it light as a um, the juice of one lemon, okay? Um, other than that, a good tip, if you're drinking water, make sure you're drinking it sitting down. The reason being we don't want to drink water standing up is because it goes straight down the esophagus and right out, okay? It didn't do much. You didn't hydrate much. But when you sit down and you drink your water, it has to actually go through all of the organs. So when it goes through the organs, because everything's kind of squished, right, when you're sitting down, unless you did my posture alignment and you know how to sit down properly with a nice straight vertebrae. But anyways, uh, it's still kind of squished, right? It's not as uh, clear and open as when you're standing. The water has to seep through each organ. So each organ is going to get nicely hydrated. So that means each organ is nicely hydrated. So it's kind of like a lubrication. So as that food is passing through from esophagus to stomach to small intestine and whatnot, they're hydrated. They can pass the food more easily. So it's less of an irritation for you to break down your food and make um, a bowel movement. And then obviously by the time it comes out of your rectum, you don't want to have hard stools because it hurts. And I'll save you guys details, but basically drinking enough water. Some people say, yes, we know the trick, eight cups a day uh, of water, but I, I beg to defer on that one. I think everyone has different weights and uh, we have different levels of activity. So my rule of thumb, again, consult with your doctor is half your body weight. So if you take your body weight in pounds, say you're 200 pounds, just for the simplicity of this exercise half of it is 100, okay? 100 ounces, convert that to ounces, 100 ounces and divide that by eight ounces for your cups. So 100 divided by eight, um, you're looking at almost 12, 12 cups a day. And that's not if you're active. So if you're active, maybe a little more, okay? So that to me is a little more realistic, but again, you guys need to know how much to drink because there is a problem if you drink too much water. It's not enough electrolytes and sodium to your brain. And a lot of people can die because they're flushing out. So be careful with the water thing. Like again, ask your doctor, work on your posture. I kind of touched on that. So if you guys are constantly hunched, if you're constantly, you know, sticking your, your hips forward and you're not tucking your tailbone, you're squishing all those organs and those organs are not going to perform very well. So make sure you guys are definitely working on your posture, standing straight, uh, sitting straight. And believe it or not, eating while standing is probably the best posture to, to get into, right? Um, 
just because the food is not going all the way down and stopping and being squished. If you're standing, it's kind of going straight down. Um, let's see. I think I have someone in the chat. Let's see. Does that have to be water or just liquid? Okay, so water or just liquid, any liquid you want to kind of think about it. If you want to flush out a liquid, probably remain standing. But water is something you really want in your body. Okay, so if it's like a tea, a coffee, a juice, I don't know, up to you. Um, you are not trying to really use that as hydrating because water, when I say water, I literally mean water. So I don't mean tea, coffee, or juices, or smooth. I'm talking strictly water. So I'd always suggest remain seated while drinking your water. Anything else, like you want caffeine, by default, you're going to get a buzz <laughs> and you don't want too much let it in and out. Go ahead and remain standing. That's up to you. What about alkaline water? Alkaline water is more alkalinizing, obviously. Um, if you guys have issues, maybe you have too much stomach acid, like you're getting heartburn all the time, you're constantly popping Tums like they're candy. <laughs> maybe you have acid reflux. Alkalized water can help. But at that point, I'd also be looking at your diet and see if you're eating too many acidic foods, right? Acidic foods would be anything from an animal. So definitely talk to your doctor about that. However, I do know a lot of Western medicine are not pushing a plant-based diet. I think um, mainly, you know, Western medicine, they're pushing, you know, pills or surgeries or whatnot. I haven't heard many uh, doctors say uh, going to plant-based diet could help with anything acid related, but alkalized water is great. Um, I personally don't, don't drink it because I don't like my water processed, but I do have my water purified, but I do eat a plant-based diet. So I'm pretty much alkalinized, but to each their own, but good questions. Exercise. Okay. Exercise is great because when you're jumping and twisting and turning, you're rubbing your organs against each other. So it's kind of like massaging your organs. So when you're kind of rubbing those organs against each other and they're massaging, guess what? They're going to let the food pass more freely from one organ to the next. So exercise is great for plethora of reasons. One of them being your digestive tract. So please make sure you get some type of um, activity in. Last but not least is eat in a calm place and try to eat in the same place every time. Think of your digestive system like a child, right? You don't want it to get ruly on you. You don't want it running around in the sense of, I'm not hungry now. I really should eat. I'm going to skip a meal. That's not good. You want to train your digestive system to kind of get on a schedule, right? You want a bowel movement at least once a day, hopefully, right? That's the goal. And you want to make sure you're calm, not stressed. When you're stressed, we eat too much. We eat too quick. Maybe we inhale our food. We're taking in air. And you want to be relaxed because when you're stressed, your muscles tense up. And guess what? You have muscles inside of your body too. And those are the same muscles that help push our food out. So you want everything to be nice and calm. So I like to sit somewhere where I know I'm calm. I'm not distracted and just focus on what I'm eating. So I can pay attention, make sure I'm eating everything properly, not inhaling, try not drinking too much water and eating at the same time. Just really enjoy your meal, at least a good 30 minutes, right? If not 20, we'll do. For inhaling super quickly, I already talked about all the problems we may have. All right, let's go ahead and keep it moving here. Next slide. Okay, some stuff to avoid. Now don't hate me because this is the part where no one likes to hear <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> and I know the holiday season's coming up, we have parties, but alcohol is not good because it's acidic. Okay, it's not an animal based product, but it's still acidic because it's an alcohol. So we already talked about how when you have too much acid in the body, we can have a lot of internal issues um, in the esophagus and stomach. So alcohol is just throwing more acid on top of existing acid. So mind your alcohol levels. If you're like, no, Roxana, you're, you're crazy. I'm not going to give up alcohol. Just mind your levels, okay, of how many um, cups you're drinking or beverages you're in, uh, in taking. Bread. Bread, believe it or not, is not very good. Reason being, um, there's already gas in bread. By bread, I mean the yeast, when it's being killed in the oven, they release gas of their own. So you see those little bubbles inside your bread. That's why it's not smooth. So when you're chewing, right, you're not actually chewing a full solid. You're chewing something that already has air in it. So that's extra air, okay? Now, also depending, a lot of um, yeast, right, and flour and gluten is um, something that bothers a lot of us. We're sensitive to it or we are allergic to it. I did my blood work panel and I found out I'm actually allergic to gluten, which is why I always felt bloated after I ate bread, right? So mind your breads. If you have questions, ask your doctor, see if you can do a, a blood test or allergy test. Maybe that's why you're always bloated after you eat. Maybe you're also allergic or you have sensitivity too, to either gluten and or um, whatever else kind of bread you're eating. All right, let's see, I have a question here, chat. Blue Zone recommends sourdough. What are your thoughts on it versus non-sourdough? 
Yeah, sourdough is tricky to me. Actually, if you want to do bread, I'd actually do a bread without yeast and flour. So flatbread doesn't have yeast and flour. Then at that point, it's not even bread, right? <laughs> um, just because uh, bread is basically not very nutritional. And considering a lot of people cut the crust off bread or we only eat the inside because it's soft, um, that's where most of the nutrition lies is in the crust. But then once you take that off, there's not much going in. So basically you're eating empty calories with no nutritional value. It's a straight um, carb that goes into you know fat because a lot of us, we don't uh, exercise enough to burn that energy. So for me personally, between sourdough and regular, at this point, it's a lost cause. Um, if you're going to eat a bread, uh, I would, again, if you want to take out the yeast, make it a flat bread and then try to avoid flour. So it's gluten-free. But again, I know that sounds boring because it's not even a, a bread you're going to probably enjoy. So that's my two cents, but good question. Um, carbonated drinks and sugary drinks and processed sugars, artificial sweeteners. Okay. So all of those processed baked sugars are all acidic. Again, they may not be, you know, from an animal, they're processed sugars, but because they're fake, they're very acidic and that's going to cause the same issues we had earlier. So I don't care if you're like, oh, I need my Gatorade. Oh, I need my, you know, Lipton iced tea, right? Those are all artificially sweetened. So yes, that does mean Splenda, Stevia, all of those processed sugars. It's not a natural sugar you find in nature like honey, right? Assuming your honey is uh, wild honey. So I stay away from those processed sugars because they're acidic and they can cause a lot of gas, right? Uh, milk and white chocolate for the same reason. They're processed, so they have processed sugar. Foods high in saturated fats, creams and cheeses. Anything that has high fat content is going to be really hard to digest. Now, this goes back to how much uh, stomach acid you have in your stomach, right? If you're eating a very heavy food, like some of you guys maybe have gone to a French restaurant, you know, they're very high on butter and creams, aiolis and whatnot. They love those uh, high fats. They're very flavorful but it takes forever for your stomach to have enough stomach acid to break it down. So sometimes when you eat a meal like that, you feel like you can, you know, probably not eat anything till the next day. That's because your stomach acid has to actually stop and ramp up the level of stomach acid in your stomach. And by the time it takes for it to ramp up the amount of stomach acid, you need to break down that food. You may have heartburn, acid reflux, bloating in the stomach. You feel heavy, you feel sluggish. Um, it's because your body is basically shutting down and trying to concentrate on your stomach, breaking it down. So all energy, it's like all hands on deck are going straight to the stomach to increase that um, stomach acid level. So caffeinated drinks, coffee, energy drinks, uh, tea, not every tea is herbal. Black tea and green tea are high in caffeine. Even if you get them decaffeinated, they're still very high. The only caffeine free would be obviously an herbal tea. Caffeine is a stimulant to the intestines, and I do not like caffeine. One, all it does is it stimulates the intestines, so it forces the food out of you, okay? So I don't like anything to be forced out. I want my, my body to do it naturally on its own terms and making sure that it's getting the nutrients it needs out of it. I don't want it to rush that system. I don't want it to just go in and out. No, I want you to take out my nutrients. I want to take out my water to make sure I'm hydrating myself and then process it. So a lot of people I feel use um, caffeine as uh, a laxative to help them go. I don't think that's a very natural thing to do to your body. I think it's kind of forcing it down. Like when you force feed something, um, I'm not a fan. So if you need them every now and then it's good to have an energy drink or coffee or caffeinated tea, but all the time, every day, I'm going to say no. I don't think your your digestive system needs all that stimulants and all that pushing because it's not letting it do its job. It's kind of like over um, uh, coming in and telling your organs what to do. And, and, you know, I think they know better. Spicy foods. Oh gosh, acidic. Okay. Plant-based or not spicy, is spicy. So it's still acidic. So acid on top of acid, you already know now. Greasy foods, they're high in fat. So it's fast food. It's a uh, processed food anything out of a box, chips out of a bag, even if they're baked chips, okay, they're still grease, there's oil. So those are high in fat. They're gonna take a while for things to break down. Stress, we're gonna talk about stress. Believe it or not, when you are stressed, your stomach acid levels go up. So you're like, I didn't eat anything all day. Why do I have heartburn? What's going on here? Well, you have a lot of stomach acid and it's churning and it may come up, okay? Also, stress won't let your digestive system function properly, right? Because it's kind of like the muscles are contracted. What do we need our muscles to do? We need our muscles to actually go in and out. It's like a rippling wave, okay? There's a difference between holding everything in and then a rippling wave. So again, making sure you're relaxed. 
and whatnot and trying your best not to eat stressed or be stressed can help a lot. Okay. Any questions thus far before we start on this next slide? Feel free to come off mute. I don't want to go too fast where you're like talking too much and boring you guys. No? Okay. All right, you guys. So here are some fun facts to improve your digestion. Don't lie down after eating at least two to three hours, especially before sleeping. So this one's fun. Um, I did give you guys a tip. If you're going to eat, try eat standing up, right? Maybe around your kitchen counter or maybe um, wherever you can. Not walking. I said standing, not walking because you don't want to walk and eat. God forbid you choke. I just recommended standing just because the organs are less smushed. But don't lie down because you don't want everything to kind of stop, right? Because when you're lying down, it's kind of hard to push everything down out that way because now you're horizontal, right? So it's not to say that it won't come out. It will, but you're just making the job of your organs harder to digest the food. Also, if you go to sleep right after eating a heavy meal, you haven't given your digestive system a head start to say, hey, let me at least get some things down before you put me in a horizontal position and make my job harder, okay? So at least give it at least two, three hours a head start, and then you can either go to bed. So that means you have to probably time your dinner two to three hours before you start sleeping. So by the time you're finished eating your dinner, you have that full two, three hour window, okay? So if you start eating at six, you eat till 6.30, don't go to bed maybe until around 8.30, 9.30. It will help, so give it a try. That one is a really good tip. Try eating standing up, that's number two. Drink water sitting down, I already did that. Eating quickly, Rudy went over that one. Okay, here's the question I'm gonna ask you guys. What do you guys think is the best way to eat? Eating smaller meals more often as to not overwhelm the body with large meals or eat well-proportioned meals three times a day. All right, you guys, so I'm gonna lay it out. So how often you should eat is gonna depend on your activity level, okay? So that's gonna be the winning factor. So here's my example. I used to play basketball. When you're on a basketball team, my practices were three hours long, six days a week. I'm burning about 1800 calories in the one practice. Okay. That's a lot of energy I need to eat. So I was eating probably almost 6,000 calories a day because that's not including the amount of calories I burned throughout the day. So outside of practice, you're walking around, you're bending over, picking things off the floor. Those are still calories being burned. So what I had to do because I was so active, I had to eat very small, uh, very big meals very often. So I had six meals a day, averaging about a thousand calories each. That was me. That's because my activity level. If you're a waitress, you're on your feet for eight to nine hour shifts. That's a lot of activity. So you're probably going to need to eat on your 15 minute break, you know, your lunch, and then your next 15 minute break to keep your energy levels up so you can keep doing your job. If you guys know you have a sedentary lifestyle, maybe you can eat fewer meals. But here's what I believe. You guys have to be really honest with yourselves and be like, look, what am I doing in my life? Okay, do I want to think I'm 18 again and I'm going to burn all these calories just by waking up? No. So a really good test you can do is it's called RMR test. It's called your resting metabolic rate. I'm going to actually type that in the chat right here. Resting metabolic rate. Oh, let me spell it right. Rate test. Okay. So you can ask your doctor about it. Basically what it does, it's a test you do, you either breathe through a tube and they count the sugars in your saliva, or they put you in this little fake pool. It's like a shallow two foot pool and they put you under and see about your fat buoyancy. I don't know. I'm not scientific, but um, basically what it tells you, it tells you how many calories you burn in a day. So this is what happens. If you were to wake up and you just stay in bed, you don't move a muscle. You don't even move your arm. You don't roll over. You just lay there. So however you woke up, you stay there for all day. That's how many calories you would burn naturally. So some people, it may be 1,000 calories. Some people, for me, it's 1,750. So if I laid in bed, I'd burn 1,750 all day just laying still. Now, we have to average at least three to 500 calories of moving around, right? Loading the dishwasher, folding laundry, walking from your bathroom to your bedroom. Those are still calories burned. Depending on how active, it could be three to 500 calories. On top of that, whatever activity you're doing, you're taking your dog for a walk, you're going to go and, and do a, um, a hike. You're going to play tennis, whatever it is. Now, you always want to hit zero to maintain weight. You want to hit underneath to lose weight and then over if you need to gain weight. So based on your lifestyle plus your calorie needs, you're going to need to start eating accordingly. Like me, I'm a personal trainer. I have eight classes today. I need to eat often. My Mondays, I have one class. So I'm probably going to adjust accordingly. 
So each day may be different for you guys. I do recommend eating within one hour of waking up because one hour your brain has been fully alert at this time and you need to get something in your system because your brain cannot function without energy. So try to aim to eat something. It doesn't have to be a full meal. Maybe it's your morning snack, right? Maybe it is your full meal. I don't know. But you have to eat something at least one hour. And then if you feel good for anywhere between two to three hours, you should have some type of meal. I don't like going more than three, three and a half hours because that's when your metabolism and your energy levels yeah. start to deplete. That's when you can do maybe a small snack. If you're like, no, Roxana, I can't do too many small meals. I feel nauseous. Some people have a very small stomach and they feel very overwhelmed if they eat too often. So some people can't do big meals uh, three times a day. They feel like it's too much. They do small three meals or they do small six meals or they do like me big six meals right but that's not every day so you have to feel how you feel nauseous or not and then feel your energy levels because you want your blood sugar to be somewhat stabilized one good tip this is the size of your stomach you take your fist and you cover it with one hand this is the size of your stomach now you have to fill that anything more than that the stomach will stretch and that's when people feel like oh i ate too much i have stomach pain or i feel nauseous but some of you are like, you know what? I've been running around all day. I need my energy. Just be mindful. That's why eating slowly, it takes 20 minutes for your brain to know, hey, you're full. So if you eat slowly, you'll get there quickly. So always remember your stomach's different from someone else's stomach. And don't forget your stomach is a hanging organ. It hangs from four channels and it kind of looks like a little banana right here. And when you go and do walk or swim, they're like, don't swim, you know, 45 minutes after eating because your stomach's full. And if you go do an activity afterwards, you may feel nauseous. So mind when you're eating, how much you're eating, your activity for the day, it may be different from one day and your sleep levels. One day you wake up early, you wake up at seven, you have to eat before eight, or maybe you sleep in 11 and you have to eat before noon. Every day is different. So just be aware and be present because there's no uh, cookie cutter rule. There's no stencil of like, oh, I got to fit in here every day. Every day is different for you. Even if it's the same you, same body, it's still a different day. So any questions about that? I know that was a really heavy, um, heavy answer, but no. Okay, good. Let's continue on. We're almost kind of done. This is going to be the good stuff now. So keep a food journal. If you guys are like, Roxanne, I have no clue what's going on. I talked to my doctor. Well, guess what? Your doctor's not going to know either. You are the only one who knows. So if you feel like you ate breakfast today, give it a few minutes to hours. Do I have aches and pains? Am I bloated? Do I feel sluggish? Do I feel lethargic, sleepy? They could be signs of allergies, sensitivities, or maybe you're eating the wrong thing at the wrong time. Like, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't be eating, you know, a Big Mac for breakfast. Maybe, I don't know, save it for after you do like a crazy workout. I don't know. Um, so mind what you eat when, keep a food journal. Any questions about this slide of the fun facts? I know I really kind of kill them, but hopefully they're well received. Okay, next question. I'm going to make this uh, kind of short and sweet. My uh, story on why I have gone into digestive health and I'm um, trying to share my information I've learned is I moved to Australia a few years back. By few years, I mean six years. And uh, getting acquainted to the different types of uh, meats and foods especially were different for me. They do not have the same rules when it comes to animal treatment with antibiotics, hormones, feed. Every country is different for the most part. And whether they were better for me or not, I'm not going to say America's the best or the worst. Um, it was just different. And I had really tough time digesting meat out in Australia. So um, I lived there for almost half a year. So six months. And every six months, we do get new cells in the body, right? It's a completely revamping of your, you know, new, new, new cells. So when I came back to America, I had a tough time eating meat because I'd gone for so long not eating it. So by default, I became an accidental vegetarian didn't plan on it. I, I tried, but when you go for six months without eating meat, my experience was your stomach acid decreases, right? Because we don't need that much acid to break down um, a vegetarian meal, right? It's only eggs and dairy and uh, plants. So my stomach acid decreased. And also I just, I couldn't stomach it. And then uh, unfortunately, a few years later, my mom got breast cancer again. It was her second time. And I was her caregiver. And it was a lot of responsibility on me to help, you know, feed her, take care of her, so I researched whatever I could. In my research, I found everything that said plant-based does re uh, reduce the chance of cancers and ailments um, from obesity, diabetes, and cholesterol. And this is where I obviously have to say I cannot give you guys medical advice. This is just my experience. So um, plant-based is alkalinized and our body is alkalinized. So when you eat something that matches what you are, 
things run a little bit more smoothly. So I went plant-based vegan to help my mom to, to be supportive of her so we can eat together. <laughs> she didn't go vegan, but I did. <laughs> So I got um, a really good, you know, learning experience out of it. And I, again, it was a completely accidental thing. I did it to support her. I made her juices and smoothies and I switched out her dairy um, to plant-based because she loved yogurt. And uh, she did learn a few good things, but she didn't stay. And But I did. And the next slide is all the stuff I felt going plant-based. So my digestion is way more often. So I never had a problem earlier. I went once a day. But the thing is, I don't know if you guys know this, you're supposed to go once per meal. Did you guys know that? For every meal you have in a day, there should be one bowel movement. So if you have four meals, four bowel movements, six meals, six, three, three, you get it. So that means your digestive tract has to work so efficiently that it's able to break it down and push it out. Optimal is 45 minutes. Now, I don't know whose digestive tract is clean as a whistle where it gets out in 45 minutes, a good person is about two to three hours. And some people it's a day, some people are constipated and it may be a few days a week or even two weeks, okay? But ideally that is how your digestive system is supposed to operate. Uh, no more heartburn. Not only was I eating a lot of animal-based foods when I was younger, um, I used to eat spicy foods all the time. So I used to have heartburn since 17. I used to eat Tums all the time. My doctor told me I was gonna get acid reflux disease or even burn a hole in my stomach, which is called an ulcer. Okay. He was like, you need to lay off the spicy foods. I didn't care. But now that I've gone plant-based, I actually have no heartburn. I take no pills, no times, no nothing. The other one is interesting. The cuticles on your nails. Okay. Mine totally decreased. I used to have a lot of cuticle growth. So I always had to constantly cut them and push them back. And I realized they kind of decreased a lot. Now, I don't know what that says, but it's something I noticed since going plant-based feeling lighter and I can move afterwards. So normally when I used to eat, I used to feel really slow, lethargic, heavy, like I'm going to fall asleep, kind of like every day was Thanksgiving, right? You just want to take a nap. But now when I eat, I have a lot of energy. And even though I'm much older, when I used to play basketball, basketball is probably 15 years ago, and I used to practice for three hours. Now I don't play basketball, but I'm still teaching five to eight classes a day, and I can keep up. And um it's, it's great because I've gotten older, right? So when you think when you get older, you have less energy, but I have probably just as much energy when I did when I was younger. So it's kind of feeling like I'm youthful again. And then faster recovery time. So again, playing sports, I used to feel really sore after any practice or any conditioning, leg day, weight training day. I used to feel like I can't walk. Every muscle was so painful. I was like, oh, the lactic acid. I could feel how sore my muscles were. Now it literally takes maybe not even half an hour to an hour afterwards and the soreness is gone. On a bad day, if I've really pushed myself hard in a workout, maybe one day recovery time, maybe, but it's very few and far between. That means my muscles are recovering much more quickly. Um, I'm not gonna prove any of this scientifically because I'm not a scientist, but I'm just sharing all the stuff I have felt physically in my body. And for these six reasons here, I have stayed on a plant-based diet. That's my personal choice not being emotional, not saying for the world, for animals to each their own, you do what you want. I'm just saying, I kind of liked feeling this way after my mom was sick with cancer. She continued eating an omnivorous diet and I stayed on a plant-based. So what have I learned? I've also learned this thing called mono meals, okay? Mono meals is exactly what it sounds like. You eat one thing for a meal. So basically it means if you feel like you've had a really heavy night out, like you went out to a party and you ate a lot of junk food, whether it be pizza or I don't know, maybe they ordered fast food. I, I have no clue, but we all know what kind of foods they are. The next day I like to do a mono meal. So it means I eat one thing for the amount of calories I eat. So if I normally eat a breakfast snack of two to 300 calories, I'm going to eat one piece of fruit for two to 300 calories worth. So maybe that might look like two, three bananas or peaches. It's just going to be a fruit. And I know some of you guys are like, oh my gosh, the sugar. This is not to do every day, all the time. It's a mono meal. That means one meal, not a day, not a week, not a lifestyle. So if you feel really heavy after eating a certain meal and you want to feel lighter, it's easier for your, your digestive tract to break down one fruit. So when you have a large portion of it, it's like, oh, this is it. It's just apples. Okay, great. Let's break this down. And then guess what happens to our digestive tract? It kind of works on the backlog, right? The backlog being the last meal you ate, which is really heavy. It's because what happens is your intestines are kind of like a pipe, okay? 
So just like a pipe, over time, you're going to see the outsides of the pipe they get dirty, they get clogged. They always show you the commercial on TV where it's like the, the plumbing, you wanna clear the sides of that, that pipe. That's what your digestive tract looks like. When you don't do a good job digesting your food, the sides of your intestines get kind of clogged up. And um, when you turn on the engine, if you will, by eating a simple meal, like a mono meal, not only do you get to digest the food you normally eat, it passes through more quickly, it starts to clean those outer ridges of the, the intestines, whatever's been stuck there. Okay. So that's why it's really easy for you to get your calories, get your energy, keep a simple meal. And then you're also helping your body break down your last meal you had, which is a little tough for you. Okay. Um, what I've also learned eating foods in order of digestion, which is exactly what we have, right? I'm going to get to that next drinking boiled water. That's cool down to warm. So drinking water is one thing we talked about alkalized water versus regular water. But when you drink boiled water, it's actually more um, cleansing and the properties are more hydrating, okay? Because you've boiled off any impurities in your water, hopefully, right? If not most of them. So drinking boiled water and then waiting until it cools down to warm. You never want to drink anything hot, hot tea, hot coffee, hot soup. You don't want that because A, you're burning the lining in your esophagus, which is making you more prone to um, acid reflux, right? Because when the acid comes up, it's already worn away, then that acid burns more and you can cause some severe esophagus issues. Also, it may up your intake of esophagus cancer, okay? If you have too many hot foods in your diet, you're constantly wearing away the lining. It's not gonna be there to protect you when you, God forbid, have acid reflux or something spicy coming up, right? So uh, making sure whatever you eat or drink should be warm, never hot. Be nice to your esophagus, be nice to your esophagus lining. You never know when you're gonna need it, which I think is every day. <laughs> so drink and eat warm things. Okay. Wait until they're, they're cool down to warm, never hot exercise, obviously, uh, keeping your body moving. That's nothing really new. All right. Oh, okay. Orders of foods, digestive rates. So if I like Roxana, I'm not changing my diet. I'm not going plant-based. Great. You don't have to, but here's the order of foods. Order of foods is going to be based on the amount of water in each food. Okay. So melons are the most hydrating food fruit or food on the planet. They're about 80% water. So when you eat them, they're hydrating for your organs. They're going to hydrate you. They're going to help with your bowel movement. So if you really want to clean out your system, eat melons for breakfast. Now it can be a melon smoothie, a melon a salad bowl, you know, just chopped up melons, make it like a fruit bowl, or just pick one melon and have at it, whatever you want. Um, but I will recommend be home and be near a toilet. The bowel movements will come very quickly and very frequently. So maybe about three, four or five times um, has been my experience. They clean everything out. So when you notice that I'm going to get TMI here, the stools would be very small, like those little small stools you see, because it's cleaning the ridges on the outside of your intestines, right? What I talked about earlier, those little stuff that kind of stuck on the side, it's going to easy. It's going to be very easy to digest, digest these melons, but it's also going to backlog, work on that backlog and clean those guys out. And they will come frequently. So if you're going to eat melons for breakfast to clean yourself out, be near a toilet. <laughs> The next thing that has the most water is gonna be fruits, okay? The juices, if you're gonna eat, do a fruit juice and then smoothies, cause that's fiber. Or if you're gonna eat the whole fruit, like a solid, and um, they're about anywhere between 70 to 75% water. So those things are gonna be the next most hydrating thing. Um, and then obviously, like I said, juices have no fiber. So if you're like, what's the difference between a juice? If you do an actual fruit juice, not the ones you buy from the store, right? The store ones, they have either preservatives or they're really fake in the process. They're not even 100% juice. So if you make your own juice at home, um, it has no fiber in it, depending on how well of a juicer you have. And then smoothies, it keeps the fiber. All you're doing is blending that fruit. Okay. Then vegetables have the next amount of water. Um, I think they're anywhere between 60 to 70% water. And then you have uh, raw plants, like your greens, like spinach, basil, kale, and fungi, which is mushrooms. A lot of people don't know fungi is its own category. It's not in the animalia kingdom or plant kingdom. Fungus, mushrooms are in their own kingdom called fungi. If anything, they're actually closer to an animal kingdom because they have to hunt for their own food, which they hunt by eating the nutrients and whatever the wind brings to them and they absorb through the spores. So mushrooms are closer to an animal than a plant. So fun fact there. And then after that, you have your cooked plants and fungi, right? So once you start cooking stuff, they release their water, not as much water. So that's why they're there on that list. And then you have your starches, like your potatoes, carrots, any of your root vegetables, assuming again that these guys are cooked, okay? And then you have your fats. You have your nuts and seeds, right? 
um, cooked or not really, there's not much water in seeds, um, unless you guys are juicing them and you're getting your own milk juice, then obviously raw is going to have more water than cooked. <laughs> and then your dairy, and then your proteins, like your meat, meat and um, eggs. Okay. Not much water in those guys. Uh, even if you're like a, a real carnivore and you have a lot of blood in your steak, you like it medium, medium rare, still not that much as uh, next to a piece of melon. Okay. So if you guys can eat your same omnivorous diet, that's great but eat these foods in this order. So if one day you're like, okay, I'm gonna have a vegetable juice for breakfast, great. Don't have melons after that because the melons are gonna catch up in your intestinal uh, organ and they're gonna wanna compete to come out, right? And the vegetables are like, no, we were here first. And the melons are like, well, I caught up to you because I'm more water. So I got here more quickly because water goes down more quickly than a solid. And what's gonna happen is the food spike and that causes bloating. So that's why some people are like, oh, I have a salad for dinner or I have a fruit salad for for dessert for dinner and then I had a, a hamburger for lunch I'm always bloated what's up with that well the hamburger is probably still sitting there and here comes the fruit or whatever you had and it's going to find and catch up to that one part in your intestine and they're both going to want to try to get out the door have you seen two people try to get out the door they get stuck <laughs> well the intestines expand and that's bloating so be mindful of what you eat don't eat backwards so don't eat dairy first in the morning and then try to eat salad for lunch and then go back to something else so try to eat them in order all right a for effort, easier said than done. So what I eat in a day, I start off my breakfast um, with either melons, either juice or smoothie. Um, if I'm trying to detox, I'll stay at home. And then um, if not, I'll do like a fruit salad or I'll do a green juice or a green smoothie. Okay. So basically I, I do something on the fruit or melon family for breakfast. Okay. Now I know again, you guys are saying sugars, but mind you, these are real fruits and vegetables, not processed. And actually the sugar in fruit and vegetables is a natural sugar and it gets absorbed more easily into the bloodstream. Even if you're like, oh, Roxanne, I have diabetes. My doctor tells me otherwise. Look into that. There is new stuff coming out saying it's not the same sugar as eating a cookie. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. For lunch, I always do salads or maybe a vegetable soup of some sort. And then for dinner, it's gonna be cooked, okay? I'm eating an order. So I'm gonna do some type of carb, quinoa, wild rice, brown rice with more cooked vegetables. And then my protein will be obviously a, a bean patty or, um, you know, like a burger, a vegetable burger, or I can do a lentil stew or baked beans, tofu, tempeh. And this is going to be mine. Lately for the last month, I've been doing a raw vegan. So I only stay between numbers one and four. So that means I'm only eating salads, fruits, and vegetables. And that has made me um, increase my sleep, not only my sleep, my quality of sleep. Um, again, that's just a personal thing I've learned when going plant-based as I did an all raw vegan day. I had lots of energy because it's really easy to digest water-based food. And when I sleep, I don't have to have my body work so much on my digestion. So it's really easy for me to get to sleep more quickly and I'm knocked out. I have a deep uh, level of sleep. Eating out. So if you guys are going to go to a party or a restaurant, try to eat off with, um, start off with a salad, right? Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, nothing cooked. Work your way over to a soup, hopefully a vegetable-based soup. Then you go on to your carbs, like pasta, rice, quinoa, and then go to your proteins. You can have cooked greens. Cooked greens are kind of like a neutral, right? They're neither bad um, nor, nor good. So they're not going to cause you too many problems unless God forbid you have an allergy towards a certain vegetable. Avoid alcohol. Drink your warm water, maybe with lemon. It's a little more detoxing. So that can be your drink of choice. And then if you're going to do desserts, make sure that they're either nut or seed-based cheeses, right? No dairy. If you want to help avoid the acid levels and getting yourself all mixed up or do baked goods, but don't do like a, a fruit salad for dessert. You know, some people bring out a fruit tray or fruit platter for dessert. Don't do that. It's going to really throw your order of digestion off. So this uh, list here, if you guys have ever been to a very fancy French restaurant, they actually eat in this order. Now, I don't know if they know the order of digestion rates or this is just how they know it, but they're onto something, these French people, because they always bring out your salad first and they eat in courses. Then they always bring you out a soup and then they'll give you your, your carb, right? Your pasta or whatnot, different from your, your, your meat, right? And um, they always bring out a cheese platter for dessert, right? Because cheese has the most fats, the most fatty. So French restaurants are kind of onto something with the order of what they bring out their courses in. So this is my tips. Um, any questions on any of that or any of the above? We got a good question here. Um, someone was asking about lemon adding acid. So mind you guys, anything that's a plant is an alkalinized. Now plants even have their own levels of how much acid or alkalinized they have, right? Just like how fruits and foods have certain amounts of water to less water. 
Same with fruits. So the most acidic group of fruits or plants you'll find are your citric base. So that's your lemons, your limes, your oranges, tangerines, mandarins, tangelos, uh, kumquats, um, any of those citric family fruits, they do have more acid than their other friend, like the spinach or an apple, right? But just because they have more acid does not mean that they're an acidic food. Once ingested, they're still an alkalinize. So once you ingest them, they're doing the, they're part of trying to calm that fire in your stomach and making it a little more neutral. So you have an easier time digesting. So all the acidic fruits that I just mentioned are actually alkalinized. Now, if you have like a lemon flavored, you know, lemon bar that has dairy in it, butter and egg, no, not anymore. <laughs> the acid's going to win, right? So just be mindful of what kind of fruit you're eating with what, if it's mixed with something. So if you're eating a lemon sorbet, normally some sorbets have eggs in them, right? I think it's like egg white or egg. I think it's pretty sure it's egg white or egg yolk. So if you're having a sorbet, you're like, oh, it's lemon, lime flavor. This should be alkalinized. Well, check, see if there's egg in it. If there's no egg in it, okay, great. But also be careful. They may add processed sugar. So white sugar or whatnot. So don't just assume you see lemon or fruit. It's alkalinized unless you're actually just eating the fruit by itself. But I don't know anyone who's biting into a lemon or a lime, but good question. Um, oh, someone's asking about classes I teach. Yes, I am a personal trainer. I do one-on-ones. I also do private small groups, obviously all on Zoom. Um, so if you guys want to uh, work out with me, you guys can reach out to me via my email. I think it's been on all of the waivers. Um, Let's see, what other questions do we have here? I teach a lot of uh, classes. So I do body sculpt, I do weight training, boot camp, pop Pilates, uh, pit 28, which is a, a take on high intense interval training. I do deep stretching. Um, someone else uh, asked, what is the theory you should fast for 14 hours a day, not eating from certain hours? Okay, fasting, the whole uh, fasting or whatnot. I, again, don't believe in it because it has to go with your activity levels. So when they say, I only eat from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. and I don't eat afterwards, okay. If you do this, I hope you guys know your body's kind of like a caveman. It's not very complicated. That poor caveman's a very simple creature. If you're not feeding it every so often while you're awake, because when you're awake, your brain needs to function. That's the only organ you guys really need to keep afloat. So you need an equal amount of water and sodium. That means electrolytes are super important. So your brain needs an equal balance of both. If you're going for a long period of time, not getting enough sodium, which is not a big issue for Americans because 10 out of 11 Americans are eating more than one and a half times the recommended sodium level. But regardless, if you're going from four o'clock and you're up until 11 o'clock at night, that's seven hours of not taking anything. Your brain's not going to be happy and it can mal not malfunction, but kind of shut down, right? You get tired. It's not going to remember. Uh, I don't believe in that. I think as long as you're awake, you need to be eating something every so often because your brain is the most important thing. People who are doing fast like that are mainly trying to lose weight. And look, I'm old school, even though I'm only 34. Uh, I know I definitely don't have many years on anyone here, but out of respect for what's going on, you guys have to keep it simple. If you're going to fast for weight purposes to lose weight, I'm going to say eat clean, which we all kind of know what it is now based on what you want to preference it to and exercise. You need to have a deficit of calories. That doesn't mean you eat 3,000 calories a day and then you go down to 1,000 calories a day because you're fasting, you're only eating between a five hour window or whatever it is. Also, you're going to lose weight. No, what your body's going to do, it's going to say, Hey, I'm a caveman. There's no food around me. She's not feeding me. So I'm going to hold on to all of my fat and I'm going to keep it here for storage. So those five hours you're eating, I don't care if you're eating salads all day long, you're not going to burn anything because your food's going to hang on to it for storage because it doesn't know if this is a. Um, what do you call it? a drought, right? It doesn't know if there's no food out there. Maybe all the animals ran away. Remember, it's a caveman mentality. So until you start incorporating a regular amount of food every so often, your metabolism will not take a hit. It's going to keep going. And that's the whole reason you guys want to eat a certain amount often because you need to keep up your metabolism. Once it shuts down, that's when people start gaining weight. So it's a fine line of not eating enough, but also not knowing when to eat. Okay, you need to eat often enough. And if you don't, because of those fasts, you're not going to lose the weight you want. Now, what's going to happen is people are going to, like, okay, I'm going to stick to this fast. After three months of sticking to a fast, and again, I'm using the example 11 to four, because that's the question that was put here. Um, your body's going to go into starvation mode. So that means for three months, you've been eating 11 to four, you're not eating enough calories, and then it's going to lose the weight, but only because you're starving it, not because your metabolism is working more effectively, not because you're training your body how to burn that fuel. 
So you don't want to trick your mind into losing weight in a very harsh manner. It's very hard on your intestines, especially your heart. Uh, you can be overweight and anorexic. Anorexic means you're not eating enough nutrients. You don't take enough nutrients, or maybe you have a really bad diet where all you're eating is like bread, cheese, you know, garbage processed stuff, fast food. There's no nutrients, no salads, no greens. You can still be anorexic. Anorexic means you're not taking enough nutrients. So I don't care what your weight is on the scale. Something like that, 11 to four, I don't know how many nutrients you're going to get in those five hours. You can become anorexic. That's when people come malnutrition. Become malnutrition. Oh my gosh, you get a lot of problems. People get kidney stones. You can have heart failure. Your, your heart is a muscle and it's going to have a really tough time keeping up with you. That's why a lot of people who are heavy have a heart issues, but also people who are really underweight have heart issues. So I am totally against fasting. I'm against any of those diets, keto, paleo. Don't restrict a food group. Don't restrict your time windows. Um, we can talk about it more. Again, we're way over. I think it's 15 minutes past, but <laughs> feel free to message me or email me. Um, what else is there? Sparkling water. Sparkling water is processed. I don't trust anything processed. I think you guys can tell right now I'm pretty old school. So either if you can't make it yourself, don't trust it. And if you can't make it yourself, how many tools are you using to make it? You don't want to funk with your food. You want to keep your food basic. Maybe our minds have gotten more creative with modern day, you know, foods and air fryers now and fasting stuff, but your body is still that old caveman. It's like simple. You eat something good. I'm going to be good. You give me energy. I'll give you energy. You take care of me. I'll take care of you. Um, thank you so much. So informative. Okay, great. Yeah. You guys are so welcome. Um, let me know what else I can do for you guys. The next session, I'm going to do a food demo. So I'm going to teach you guys how to cook some of your favorite healthy or favorite comfort foods, but in a healthy way. So we're going to do tuna fish salad sandwiches or not just tuna fish salad. And I'm going to do Mac and cheese, right? We have holidays coming up. I know that's a really popular one. Um, Geraldine, I know we were talking about dairy. So I'm going to give you a good dairy alternative for, for that food. So, uh, look out for that. It's next Tuesday, 11 o'clock. I'm um, just, let me know what you guys need. Oh, and, um, I'll be more than happy to arrange that and schedule that with Rachel and the, the gang. So I'm here to help. <laughs> have a good day, guys. Stay safe out there. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.